everybody, and welcome back to Inside Gaming. The era of arcades was built on the foundation of taking your money with incredibly difficult games that would eat your quarters faster than the poor college student eats a cup of noodle. And when that hobby moved from the arcades to home consoles, games actually didn't suddenly get way easier back then, even though companies already had your $60. From 1988's Ninja Gaiden to 1991's Super Ghouls and Ghosts, the early days were full of punishingly difficult games that would emotionally and physically crush you. But those times were soon replaced by a kinder, gentler, and more loot box filled gaming industry. Well, apparently From Software saw the opportunity to bring back that challenging difficulty and, in a lot of ways, make it more fun than punishing. Since then, the company has built an empire on what many see as just masochistic gameplay. But before they struck gold with a Soul series, FromSoft had to slog through a long, tough history. Their first major title was an ambitious first-person dungeon crawler called Kingsfield, which launched on the original PlayStation in 1994. It was only released in Japan and was quickly met with harsh criticism. Players complained about the slow-moving controls, the dark and depressing atmosphere, and the brutal difficulty. Ironically enough, some of the same aspects of the Soul series is praised for today. These unusual charms did attract a small but passionate fan base, and it told FromSoft that they may actually be onto something here. Just taking a look at Kingsfield, you can see the basic design elements that would eventually become the Soul series. Maze-like dungeons, that dark and depressing atmosphere, and most importantly, brutal difficulty. Kingsfield really was the first iteration of Dark Souls, and it had everything. Except, you know, it looked ugly, moved slow, and by this point gamers were done with super hard games. Chalk it up to bad timing, I guess. 1995's Kingsfield 2 and 1996's Kingsfield 3 unfortunately got a lot of the same criticisms. Kingsfield 3, however, did add a very important element that would impact future development of the series and eventually Dark Souls, the ability to teleport between the different cities from the map screen. Obviously, that's become pretty synonymous with From Software's game library at this point, but back in the day, it was a huge deal. The Kingsfield series would eventually be shelved for a while, so FromSoft could actually take a shot at an entirely different genre. Enter Armored Core. Armored Core hit the scene in 1997 and addressed many issues from previous FromSoft games. The series had faster gameplay, more colorful and diverse environments, and it also had giant freaking robots! Hell yes! Who doesn't love a good mecha fight? Armored Core blossomed into a beloved series and would go on to spawn 19 sequels over the next two decades. But FromSoft wasn't about to give up on its first love. In 2001, they released Kingsfield 4, alternatively titled Kingsfield The Ancient City in the US, and despite their efforts, reception to the series was still lukewarm. According to GameSpot's review at the time, while those who enjoyed the classic Kingsfield games would enjoy it, many more players will find this game unforgivably slow, overly difficult, and dull. For them, the game will be a total waste of time, if not emotionally scarring. And so, with that glaring review and many others, the series got shelved again. Obviously, From Software didn't just bounce between those two franchises their entire career. In the years before the Souls series, they went on to create a slew of surprisingly varied titles. Echo Knight, a first-person survival horror series, Another Century's Episode, another mech-based action series akin to Armored Core, the Xbox-exclusive Metal Wolf Chaos, weird one-offs like 3 Dot Game Heroes, a personal favorite, and even dipped into the stealth genre with Shadow Assault Tenchu. But none of these quite gained From Software the success they so desperately craved. Fast forward to 2009, and the gaming world is just saturated with games that hold the player's hand just a bit too much and are plagued with heavy-handed tutorials. And to the stage from software once more to attempt to bring back the era of pain with its new game, Demon's Souls. Created to be a spiritual successor to Kingsfield, and according to co-producer Takeshi Kaji, it was intended to revive a lost breed of action game. You know, the type of action game that pushes you down, takes your lunch money, and forces you to do its homework while it steals your girlfriend. The game's director, Hidetaka Miyazaki, wanted to make something challenging yet rewarding, but never intended the game to be that difficult. He was trying to keep those classic difficult game ideas, but with a modern flair and online functionality. Even saying Skyrim was a big inspiration for some of the game's combat styles. That's not to say he didn't want you to feel the pain, though. Originally, Demon's Souls had a permadeath mechanic, but in a true act of mercy, Miyazaki decided that it would be just a bit too unfair. Additionally, Miyazaki didn't tell Sony Computer Entertainment, the game's Japanese publisher, just how difficult the game would be in fear that they would force the studio to make it easier and more approachable. Demon's Souls on the surface looks like a traditional RPG, trotting out a variety of medieval-inspired weaponry, magical abilities, special traits, and so on. The game's more distinguishing aspects, unique combat, 
that, the body slash soul system and the game's soul's currency gave it a unique feel that almost instantly catapulted it into cult status. If you haven't played it, when you load up Demon Souls, you are tasked with creating a character and picking their class. After a cutscene that sets up the not at all confusing lore of the game, you're dumped into a world of hate and misery tasked with kicking demons' asses and taking names. The starting area is littered with messages scrawled on the floor that might be the least friendly tutorials in all of gaming. This is where you learn to dodge, parry, thrust, cast spells, but it's also where you die the first time. Well, hey, no worries, you'll be dying a whole lot as you make your way through the game. This simple, elegant, punishing, and rewarding style of gameplay is what led critics to shower Demon's Souls with praise upon its release. It sold shockingly well for a brutally difficult throwback too, moving 1.7 million copies by March 2015. One breakup with Sony and three years later, in fall of 2011, From Software launched the spiritual follow-up to Demon's Souls titled Dark Souls. Why not Demon's Souls 2? Well, Sony owned the IP, so a quick name change and here we go. But luckily for FromSoft, the European publisher for Demon's Souls, Bandai Namco, saw potential in the Soul series. Dark Souls fine-tuned the formula and made it a bit more approachable, but no less deadly. More importantly, Dark Souls brought the memes, from cute doggos dressed up as Great Grey Wolf Sif, the infamous You Died message, which even the Dark Souls board game got in and on a cheeky way, to Solera Vistora's patented Praise the Sun, Dark Souls was all about it. And as we all know, where the memes go, success soon follows. In the early days of Dark Souls, sharing these memes became akin to a secret handshake between players who were courageous enough to take on such a uniquely challenging game. While the meme culture surrounding the game made it more approachable, the actual community that grew from this may have been the real reason the series would eventually rise to popularity. The Dark Souls community was hot on sharing tips, tricks, and secrets to help newer players get the best experience out of the game. This type of communication between gamers harkens back to the 80s and 90s with most information about things like cheats and hidden levels being shared by word of mouth. And by January 2015, it had really taken off. Dark Souls became From Software's most popular game at the time, with 3 million units sold worldwide. That doesn't even include the sales numbers from 2012's Prepare to Die Edition or 2018's Dark Souls Remastered, which would more than double that number. So with two solid releases under their belt, From Software would absolutely have to make a sequel, right? You got it and more. As soon as development for the Prepare to Die edition of Dark Souls wrapped, the team immediately began working on Dark Souls 2. Miyazaki took a step back for this one and handed the director reins to Tomohiro Shibuya and Yui Tanamura, a move that would make Souls fans a bit uneasy. Under new direction, Dark Souls 2 made some changes that diehard fans weren't super hot on, labeling it the worst of the Souls trilogy. The weird hitboxes, unbalanced weapons, and lackluster level design all left a bad impression on the community. Honestly, the whole game just felt whelming. Not overwhelming, not underwhelming, just whelming. Despite this, critics still praised Dark Souls 2, and sales hit their marks. Between the original Dark Souls and Dark Souls 2, the series hit upwards of 8 million copies sold by January 2015. So what was series creator Hidetaki Miyazaki actually working on at this time? The first offshoot of the Soul series, Bloodborne. Releasing in March 2015, Bloodborne ditched Dark Souls' more defensive gameplay and instead focused on aggression. Along with a fresh approach to combat, Bloodborne massively shifted the art direction from high fantasy style to a more gothic Victorian era theme. Bloodborne also brought Sony Computer Entertainment and From Software back together for a publishing deal. Aw, you'll love to see it, folks. A lot of what Bloodborne would bring to the table came because of that aggressive shift to combat. And it's not just in its gameplay, it's also in its aesthetics. One of the biggest things that you can notice immediately is the shift from calling that currency souls to blood echoes. It just sounds more violent, and it suits the game's world so much better. And being locked to one console, the PlayStation 4, really didn't hurt Bloodborne at all. Apparently, the sales numbers shocked even Sony. By September 2015, Bloodborne hit a lifetime sales mark of over 3 million copies. And at the time of writing, Bloodborne stands as the best-reviewed game in FromSoft's history. And yet, the lure of the bonfire proved too tempting for Miyazaki, and in the middle of Bloodborne's development, he had begun working on Dark Souls 3 alongside Steel Battalion Heavy Armor directors Isamu Okano and Yukio Ando. Ten days prior to Dark Souls 3's proper announcement at E3 2015, some incredibly handsome game journalists broke the news on some of the game's details. Dark Souls 3 was obviously more in line with the Souls series than Bloodborne, but it did still make some notable changes. A variation on Bloodborne's weapon changing would make its way into the game, Demon's Souls magic system would properly return as focus points, and the entire game's speed, including player movement and combat, saw noticeable increases. Despite not garnering the same critical praise as Bloodborne, it still got a big ol' 3 on the end of it, so you can bet it sold well. 
And historically in the game industry, a sequel will sell really well. It's not guaranteed to be a hit, but franchises tend to do better in the long run. In fact, it became the most successful day one launch and one of the fastest selling games in Bandai Namco's history. By May 2016, just two months after its release, Bandai Namco announced that the sales of the game had already reached 3 million copies. And of course, we can't forget about the most recent addition to FromSoft's brutal game extravaganza, Sekiro Shadows Die Twice. Sekiro's development began immediately after Bloodborne's The Old Hunters DLC wrapped up, but it wasn't originally Sekiro. Rather than going with previous partners like Sony or Bandai Namco, From Software decided to pitch the game to a Western publishing giant, Activision. It might seem a bit strange to pitch a game with heavy Japanese sensibilities to the house that Call of Duty built, but they had a good reason. And just a quick aside here, the only major Japanese studio Activision worked with in the last 10 years was Platinum Games. And that was only on licensed games like Transformers Devastation and The Legend of Korra, which are not exactly unique and new IP pitches. Commenting on the reason for that change of publisher from Software's community manager, Yasuhiro Kitao said, We don't have the clout to publish outside of Asia and Japan, and so Activision was one of the companies we approached and one of the companies who said they would like to talk. Sekiro was actually originally pitched to Activision as a new installment of the Tenchu series, but shifted into its current form when both From Software and Activision realized it was much more than just another sequel. While it was probably easier to get Activision to approve the original pitch for a sequel than for the new IP that Sekiro is, the game's co-producer Robert Conkey said in an interview with GameIndustry.biz that when From Software knocks on your door and says, hey, we want to make a game, you only have one answer, right? The Soulsborne series, as it's now known, also very clearly inspired other developers to try their hand at brutally difficult games. From bigger budget games like Neo, Code Vein, and The Surge, to more indie contenders like Titan Souls, Necropolis, and Salt and Sanctuary. And all this just goes to show you just how much influence From Software and the entire Soulsborne franchise has had on the industry. But what are they doing now? The big new game on the horizon is Elden Ring, co-written by Miyazaki and notable A Song of Ice and Fire creator George R.R. R. Martin. We haven't heard anything since the teaser trailer that released in 2019, and it's entirely possible that it may be another game in a long list of games that's getting pushed further and further into the future by the COVID-19 outbreak. Former senior editor at Game Informer and current collaborator at Kinda Funny, Imran Khan, commented on Twitter that things that people think are hitting 2020 might not hit 2020, or even be shown in 2020. Khan did also say that FromSoft fans will have a lot to look forward to over the next two years, though. One of those things could potentially be the rumored Bloodborne PC port, or it could be making its way to the PlayStation 5. Though, more realistically, because of how close Khan's tweet was to the PlayStation 5 event, he was probably hinting at the recently shown off remake of Demon. Demon's Souls. This remake is being handled by Blue Point Games, who are known for their masterful development of remakes and remasters of many different series, including the God of War collection on the PlayStation 3, Flower for the PS4 and Vita, Uncharted the Nathan Drake collection, Gravity Rush Remastered, and the most recent addition to their resume, Shadow of the Colossus. So if we look quickly into Blue Point's history, we can absolutely expect a ton of game fixes to be present here while still keeping the spirit of Demon's Souls alive and well. Not to mention the trailer for the PS5 version of Demon's Souls looks amazing. And that's not all. Miyazaki did make a very interesting statement back in 2019. When asked by The Telegraph about the potential of a battle royale or other games as a service type project coming from From Software, he said, there's always the possibility. These games are definitely fun and we're interested in the patterns they are taking. If we did it, it would be a bit different. But we're definitely interested, and there's definitely that possibility in the future. We'd love to take a crack at them someday. Get ready for 1 versus 99 Dark Souls, I guess? Which would probably have you fighting giant bosses for a purple sword, only for a 12-year-old from Arkansas to backstab you and gloss over your character's corpse. So hey, maybe all your time spent in Apex Legends and Fortnite will actually amount to some skill in the 2023 release of Hidetaki Miyazaki's Dark Royale Legends of Souls. Or, you know, whatever it ends up being. And hey, just one final little note, bonus points for any of you out there who want to try and explain the plot of the Dark Souls series in the comments. We'd love to hear it because that stuff is harder to understand than the game is to actually play. And hey, thanks for watching Inside Gaming. We'll see you next time. Sony announced today that they're finally going to show off some games for the next-gen console next week. Oh, and they're telling the developers they better get on board with the PS5 and fast, because Sony has apparently let PlayStation 4 developers know that their games better also run on the PS5 starting very soon, or else. <laughs>